Yeah, we're probably good. Hello, this is Carl from LunchboxSessions.com. Welcome everyone, glad to have you with us today. Thanks so much for your time. Let's have fun with hydraulic pilot controllers, joysticks, pedals, lots of fun things today. We'd love to hear where you're from, so please let us know. To do that, you'll need to use the chat function, and the chat should be there in your YouTube screen on the right hand side. In order to be able to send us a chat, you'll need to be logged into your YouTube account or your other Google services and then you can participate and ask us questions. Oh, also about your YouTube screen, you'll notice that below the video where the description of today's session, maybe you'll have to expand that, you'll notice also that there are some files there that you can download and those are just data files that will cover some of the technologies that we'll be working with today. You might choose to print them out and have them with you on your desktop or refer to them later if you want so you'll know a bit more about the exact devices that, that we were featuring here in the live broadcast today. Please uh, ask us questions during the chat. We'll stop a few times along the way and answer your questions. And yeah, <clears throat> it'll be a busy time, so always possible that might miss a question. Sorry about that, but you're welcome to email us. <clears throat> email us at info at lunchboxsessions.com and I'll do my best, or one of us will, to catch up with you after the live broadcast. Ivan will be moderating from the Lunchbox Sessions logo on the chat screen there. And also Instructor Mark, who is isolating, as many of us have to do right now. You'll see Instructor Mark there with the, with the wrench icon next to his name. And so Mark is also going to chime in and try to help some of your questions, answer some of your questions, and clarify things as we go. Maybe I'll miss something, and it'll be great to have Mark lending a hand with those things as well. So you'll see him there in the right-hand chat window. This is our second time on YouTube Live, and so we're slowly starting to get used to how things go, but we're still new at it, so we welcome your, your feedback on how it went, the sound, the lighting, the video quality, the way we're taking care of these sessions and other things that interest you. So please uh, lend us a hand, let us know how we're doing, and we'll keep improving our technique as we can. I want to give a shout out to my great friends at fluidpowerworld.com. This is your resource for components. It's a great place to catch up on what's going on in machinery design, the latest thinking in system engineering. Also keep track of the events link on fluidpowerworld.com. Keep track there for the Fluid Power Technology Conference. Yeah, it's a little tough this year to get in-person conferences to work out, but they will resume again before too long. Minnesota, Detroit, those are some of the locations that are coming at some point, and these are great two, three-day events. I look forward to meeting you at the, for the learning that we do at those great conferences. So uh, fluidpowerworld.com, please keep track of that one. Today's sponsor is HBC Radiomatic. 70 years of careful and innovative development in wireless communication technology has allowed HBC Radiomatic to become a world leader in wireless remote controls for the most trusted and critical applications, including lifts and cranes and machines of all types. With a global sales and support network, HBC Radiomatic is always ready to assist with your custom remote control requirements. All right, let's get underway. So heavy booms on an excavator is... Um, you know, is something that needs a lot of forces in order to be able to lift an excavator boom. And that might be done with a lever that starts with a very light touch in the operator's cabin. Uh, in this case, might be just a manual 
hydraulic joystick that the operator pushes and pulls. We're going to cover that kind of technology today and find out what happens with that type of uh, pilot controller. If we move to something a little heavier, like a giant mining shovel, where the boom and bucket, and especially if it has a full load, might be several hundred tons. And again, the lifting of that boom will occur with a feather touch from a very small lever, and in this case it might be an electro-hydraulic lever that is then sending a signal to the rest of the hydraulic system in order to get that lifting to take place. And as you can see, some very tiny parts are involved in lifting very large machinery booms. Very tiny parts indeed. And what's also interesting to note is some of these tiny parts don't move very far. Uh, just a few millimeters, perhaps a sixteenth of an inch. There isn't a lot of motion taking place inside this type of valve. Not a lot of motion taking place whether it's an electrohydraulic pilot valve or uh, a manual hydraulic pilot valve or joystick. It's small parts and small movements. Let's head over to the learning panel and have a look directly at some of the technologies that we've got here. So, my pop quiz question of the day. You saw me working this valve when I started the, the live broadcast. When I'm moving this lever back and forth, is this valve, this particular component, is it busy brokering a stream of flow? Is this about a, f a flow that we're doing directly here at this valve? Or, or not? Well, you can see that the hoses are fairly small. These are, are quarter inch hoses, perhaps six millimeter hoses on a machine. Sometimes um, a three eighths or a dash six hose, a 10 millimeter hose. We're not talking about a very large hose, so it can't be that what's happening at this valve is about a lot of flow. Certainly not for those large excavators and, and shovels that we were talking about. No, nope. in the case of a pilot controller, in the vast majority of cases, what we're doing with this type of device is working in the field of force control. Yes, ultimately, if you see a large boom lifting on an excavator or shovel, or if the works is rotating left or right, swinging left or right, then you know that there must have been a flow of hydraulic oil. But yeah, that flow happened through some kind of directional control valve. This is a reasonably large spool, good for about 450 liters per minute, about 120 gallons per minute. But this is a device that needs to be piloted, and so the pushing of this spool back and forth in order to have that flow to the big boom lift cylinder or to the large swing motor. That starts out with force control, working against the resistance of a spring. This spring is going to be so important in our discussion. So what we're into here with a joystick, or with a pedal that might be on the floor of the operator's cab. This might be your left and right track for forward and back. You'd have two of them. I've just got one here today. And instead of a pedal plate, I put a piece of tubing on there. It gives me lots of leverage and easy to work with. But in both of these cases, these valves really belong primarily to a field of hydraulics directly that's not motion control, it's really force control hydraulics. And we control the force that is coming out of the signal ports. There's two, here there's two, we'll look at one in a minute that has four signal ports. What's really happening is that we control the force on the end of a large directional valve spool somewhere else in the system using pressure control. So these really are a type of pressure control valve and their very closest relative from just very basic hydraulic valves would be called the pressure reducing valves. Well, let's have a look at some very simple pressure valve symbols for a moment. So many of you will recognize the direct acting relief valve symbol. There's an inlet, there's an outlet, and the poppet shows that it's normally in a blocked or a closed position. That's where it rests because of tension. The spring has been dialed to a certain amount of force and it's pushing that poppet closed. And we're waiting for pressure to build up on the inlet. And if it gets great enough, then wrapping around on the pilot line, pushing that poppet to connect 
port one, the inlet, to port two, the outlet, and relief oil back to tank. And that would be a relief valve type of function with a spring, always wanting to try and push that poppet closed if it can. Well now, let's move to a very different type of symbol. If we look at the valve symbol up here, we'll see that the porting poppet arrowhead is already pointing to the open position. It's showing that we're already normally open when the valve is at rest. But very interesting to note is that on the outlet of this valve is where that pilot action takes place. And so yes, this valve can't spend all of its time. In fact, this valve can't even spend very much of its time in the open position when the system is running normally. If, if it does, then whatever the inlet pressure is would simply arrive on the outlet. So as much as it shows it's normally open, that's an at rest condition, but this valve actually does need to spend a fair amount of its time closed, as we're going to see in a moment, in order to reduce pressure. I've introduced you to the pressure reducing valve, which takes a higher inlet pressure, and depending on how you adjust it, steps you down to a lower outlet pressure. Let's move to the other learning panel, where I've already got a pressure reducing valve connected and ready to go. So you'll recognize this gauge here as our inlet port and we'll be able to monitor our inlet pressure. Ah, what's happening here? Our outlet port number one is just hitting right into, deadheaded into a, a pressure gauge. And unlike the relief valve, here we'll just switch back to the relief valve symbol for a moment. In order to adjust this type of pressure valve, you would normally have your pressure gauge on the inlet for a pressure relief valve. You would put the pressure gauge wherever the piloting action takes place, the sensing and triggering action. So on a relief valve, the gauge would be on the inlet side in order to set and adjust, but not on a pressure reducing valve. On a pressure reducing valve, the final adjustment takes place on the outlet. And believe it or not, this is the one pressure valve where you adjust it not under full flow conditions. Most pressure valves, the normally blocking, normally closed types of pressure valves are adjusted with full flow passing through. Not so the case of the pressure reducing valve. And in fact, its closest relative, if you know your pneumatic valves, is the pneumatic pressure regulator. Works in the same way. So I'm going to activate the pump and we'll see a higher pressure, perhaps eight or 900 PSI on the inlet. <clears throat> and you'll see that I have the ability to dial to whatever pressure value I want on the outlet. Okay, so here is our, our inlet pressure set by a pressure compensated pump. It's set at 800 PSI, but more importantly, on the outlet is only 300 PSI, and I could set it wherever I want, and you set the pressure reducing valve in the dead headed state. It's really one of the few pressure valves that is set that way. And what we're about to find out about pilot controllers is that pilot controllers are really just a few of these pressure reducing valves located in a convenient package for operator purposes. It's about that simple. Let's go to a pressure reducing valve simulation and have a look at how that works. All right, so here we have a, a pressure reducing valve and apparently, according to the number sitting next to the adjustment knob here, a magic adjustment number, I can adjust that here in the simulation, but apparently it's set right around the 500 PSI mark, but you wouldn't know that by reading the outlet pressure on the gauge between the outlet of the pressure reducing valve and the cylinder because the pressure reducing valve cannot step up the pressure. You may have 1200 PSI available to you from the source, the pump and whatever pressure controllers happen at the source of hydraulic flow. But here at the end of the line where we're lifting a cylinder, uh, in this case a magically recycling cylinder makes it easier for teaching, we see that the load on that cylinder only represents 200 PSI. A 2000 pound brick 
divided by a 10 square inch surface area on the bottom of the piston, 200 psi. The pressure reducing valve is not a pressure increaser valve. It can't step the pressure up. So right now, I think it's pretty easy to see that the pressure reducing valve is not in an active state. It's really wide open and this is not a good way to study the pressure reducing valve nor adjust it. We really need to get into some kind of a force control mode. So we're going to switch from flow to force. We're going to use the force. And so what we've done is put a C-clamp on the cylinder to prevent it from moving. And of course this is something that's only safe to do in a simulation, but I think you'll agree it's a great way to understand what's happening. Now we see that as we adjust the pressure reducing valve up to 90, up to 100, what we'll see is the gauge on the outlet is setting the pressure to exactly what we desire. We have a force control and in fact if we keep increasing it the, the cylinder might move ahead by, by just a tiny fraction as it bends our C-clamp because we are exerting a force and that is what the increase in pressure is doing with the surface area available to us on the bottom of the cylinder piston. So this is force control that we're into now and you'll see that the pressure reducing valve is active. In fact, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give a very quick shot of reduced setting and if you watch the main spool opening for just a moment, I think what you'll see is that the main spool will be stuck shut for just a fraction of a second as we wait for pressure to bleed down through a pilot section. This is a pilot operated pressure reducing valve and it's very easy to have it set accurately under all conditions and fluctuations of inlet and outlet pressure a very accurately setting kind. I'm going to give a quick shot of increase setting to the pressure reducing valve and again look at that main spool opening I think you'll see that there'll just be a, a short period of time where it stayed open a little longer in order to bring more of our source pressure the 2000 through to the outlet side and there we are bending our pressure reducing valve. So our, there we are, sorry, bending our C-clamp. So as you'll see as we switch back to studying our pilot controllers, what I think you're going to notice is that they are basically all pressure reducing valves and the question is how many did you put into any one of those lever operated devices. Oh, this is probably a good moment for me to remind some of our viewers as well is that these joysticks and foot pedals aren't always pushing back and forth on a directional valve spool. I've got many contacts, perhaps some of you watching, who work with um, closed loop hydrostatic pumps. And some of those closed loop hydrostatic pumps, like you would see on a coiled tubing service unit in oil field services, like you might see on a blast hole drill in a mining application, many other places, in this case the joystick or a pilot controller lever is being used to set the displacement of a closed loop hydrostatic pump to set the swash plate angle. And again, the force control or pressure control aspect of the pilot controller is being used to move small little pieces and give you a big flow from some other element. So let's move to our pilot stick simulations. Um, there we go. Animator Nathan was busy in the last while producing a new 2D joystick simulation. Animator Chris was working hard on some 3D that you'll see here in a new session on Lunchbox Sessions called Pilot Controller. And so let's open up. Uh-oh. Somehow I got logged out there. Get me back in in a hurry. There we go. So there we are with our 2D simulation of a pilot controller and what you're now looking at is a couple of standard symbols. The symbols that are out there come from a number of different symbol set standards around the world and so depending on where your machinery is built or the manufacturer's choice to adhere to one type of symbol standard or another, both of those symbols that are to the left and to the right of the cutaway joystick are typical symbols. You'll see them show up on machinery schematic as a, as a normal course of action. And so now we need to analyze those symbols a little bit and try to understand what they mean. Let's start 
with a symbol on the left-hand side of the joystick. I'm going to zoom in a bit and center. And notice what's taking place that in the normal state, before we've moved the lever at all, what we see is that both pilot heads, ah yes, here's a directional, here's a directional valve, a proportional directional valve with metering notches to perhaps operate very large flows to and from a hydraulic motor. So that's the final application, the moving of a valve spool and these springs are going to be so important to us but to focus on the symbol for the pilot controller alone for a moment we'll find out that in a typical two axis joystick we'll have four uh, we'll have four pressure controlling valves, they're basically pressure reducing valves four of them but only one might be active depending on how we use the joystick lever, and at rest, we'll find out that the valves are open through the continuous bar to the outlet that's going to our directional valve and venting it to tank. All four valves in the resting condition are venting the outlet signal ports, we'll call these, venting them to tank, and then when we start to move the lever, we'll move the lever, we'll deflect the lever only left, and operate the left side of our cutaway, but watch the symbol for the moment, if you will. That lever can't spend a lot of time in the open position, maybe in little shots, but if we're going to hold a reduced pressure on the outlet signal port and not allow the full pilot pressure coming in on the P port to sneak through, this valve has to close up. So if I go back to the neutral state and we see the valve as it's the valve symbol as it's typically drawn on the black and white schematic. It's just sitting at rest and venting to tank. But as soon as the valve becomes active, it goes into a balanced state where it is between the pilot pressure port in, in red and the blue tank return port and somehow the valve has to cut off and be in the middle ground for a while. And that's done with surface area on the spool, the control spool, and the pressure on the signal port versus the spring pressure available inside the valve itself. Okay, maybe before we look at the inside of the cutaway in the middle, let's go and look at another typical uh, symbol that shows up on excavator drawings and machinery of all kinds. What you'll see here now on the right hand side of the screen is another symbol where at rest the signal port is connected by diagonal arrow to tank pressure and the valve is in its resting state, its normal state. But as soon as we make the valve active, all of a sudden little shots of that diagonal arrow go down and grab some more, a fraction of the pressure available from the pilot supplying source and ship that pressure out to our directional valve spool. And what causes this exact pressure, this exact variable pressure to build up in the outlet of our signal port? The spring. The spring on the opposite side of the spool that we're piloting. So believe it or not, the springs that are downstream from our pilot controller are very important. Not the spring that's currently sitting inside the pilot head we're pushing. No, the spring on the opposite side. The spring that pushes back and wants to center our valve spool. And that spring is pushing back against our pilot control and setting us up with a desired amount of pressure. And that pressure on the outlet signal port is also moving the internals of our, of our pilot controller valve to the middle position, to a balance position. As I lay off on the lever and go back to a more neutral state, that little diagonal arrow jumps up and vents off gradually as the spring in our directional valve relaxes and lets that pilot pressure out to return to tank. So that's the action that you need to imagine in your mind's eye, animate in your mind's eye when you're looking at black and white schematic drawings for your machines. This is a very active valve and the symbols don't really do it justice. The manufacturers will speak about the 
the pressure valves inside the joystick as three position valves, but what you've seen is that there's a cutoff in the middle, and so now to try and understand that symbol better, let's have a look at the cutaway and see what happens. Typical to many of the pilot controllers, when at rest, the return spring and the balance and control spring, there may be both of those inside, will have, rem will have returned the control spool to the top and rest position. And look here, the drilling orifice in, in the radial face of the spool there is just barely connected into the T tank pressure port that's often, most often in the upper half of the valve itself. And so the signal ports, the, the, the signal ports that go to our directional control valve have been vented away. And then as we push down on the lever, I'll just zoom out a bit, as we push down on the lever, the wobble plate will push down on a plunger. Well, is that plunger directly moving the control spool down below? No, it's not. Watch the action there. You'll see that there is a sleeve area in here and the main spool fits into the sleeve. So this steel plunger is not pushing directly down on the spool. I'll move it around quickly just to try and give you a little bit of a feel for that. You can see how the control spool floats freely. What is the plunger doing? The plunger does not push directly on the control spool. The plunger merely tensions springs. That's all it's doing. And that is typical to almost all of the pilot controller devices that we come across. Tensions a spring, a control spring now forces, I'll go back to center and I'll walk us through it slowly. As I push down on and tension the springs, the control spool dips down and the drilling and orifice grab a little bit of that pressure that's available from our servo, our pilot supply source, the P-line, brings it through into the drilling into a bored out valve spool. You'll see the actual parts in a second here and produces that pressure down to our directional control valve in this case. You saw that the spring in the directional control valve tensions up so we get a higher pressure and the balancing action happens on the surface area here the annular surface area on the bottom of the control spool, surface area in, inside the top of the board out valve spool, moves us back into a moment of balance where that, where that drilling is now between the tank port and the pilot pressure port, and there we have it. We're in a balanced position for a moment, and the desired amount of downstream pilot pressure has been locked in place. As I back off, on the lever, the, the return spring will move back up. The control spring also will let that, that control spool dip up into the blue area of the tank return pressure port and vent off the signal pressure. And you know what's happening down below. Our directional valve spool is returning to center. Or for those of you who are watching and your stick is used for piloting purposes of a closed loop hydrostatic pump. It's allowing our pump swash plate to go back to a neutral position. It's the same thing. Okay, so we've had a good look at our 2D simulation. Let's switch over now and try to appreciate some of the action from a three-dimensional point of view. Okay, here we are. Oh, that's not where I wanted to go, actually. Wrong pick. I want to go there. And... Let's go in there. There we go. So what we'll see here in this video, we'll see lever deflection on the left with the dust boot in place. And of course in the middle the dust boot has been removed. We'll see one of our plungers there. We'll see the control spool cut away in the turquoise color. We'll see our, our control spring, our return spring. And over here in the right, a nice close up of some very critical aspects of what turns out in many cases to be a zero lapped valve. Sometimes when you want the stick to be less responsive to the operator's lever changes, then sometimes the drilling hole in the control spool is quite a bit smaller than the thickness of the control, uh, the control uh, plate area that you see there.
Okay, in our cases, we've set it up as a critical spool or a zero lap spool, so any change in deflection, and let's just watch it in action for a moment. Here comes our, our three-dimensional pilot controller in action. I think you'll see exactly what's happening. Watch the deflection of the lever on the left-hand side. Well, I think that's very self-explanatory since we've already had a good look at the two-dimensional spool action. The signal port is the orange port in the middle, and of course, it's dying off now, the pressure, as the lever returns to neutral and we relax the springs. It's all about those springs, okay? So this is modeled from a two-axis controller, and let's switch over to a PDF document for a moment. This is the exact data sheet. It was one of the three that I put there for you on your YouTube uh, page, information about today's session. The 4TH6 is what we're gonna have a look at taken apart here on the bench in a moment. Pretty much what you'll read here on the right-hand side is the function that we've been describing. So you can always read this as well to gain more understanding. There's one of the two symbols. Here is the depiction. You can tell that we modeled our three-dimensional model and our two-dimensional model from, from largely from what you see here. And what you'll find out is that these valves typically allow for and, and have a certain amount of maximum inlet pressure for a particular design range. So this one isn't supposed to see any more than 50 PSI. Uh, approximately 325, 350, uh, sorry, 50 bar, my mistake, 50 bar, approximately 325, 350 PSI, and controlling from there. And then what you find out as you go through the catalog is that there are a number of options of control curves in the model code. So 4TH6 might be the beginning of the model code, but then there's a choice for you to make as to what type of control you're after. If you're a designer of machinery, then that's very important. If you're a technician and making a replacement, it's equally important because you want to make sure you get the same characteristic control curve in replacement. And it gives us an idea that a certain amount of deflection of the lever here on the x-axis, perhaps zero to two or three degrees of lever action produces no pressure. And then all of a sudden, you'll, you'll encounter what's often referred to as breakout or breakaway pressure, where the first amount of pressure shows up and an indication of what that pressure might be in bars in this case. And then what will it be at maximum at perhaps a certain amount of lever deflection. And then if you pull on the lever any further, what happens? Does it just shoot up to wide open as it drops that drilling down into the source of pilot pressure and just boosts you up to, to actually pull your inlet pressure through to the outlet? So in a very important curve and some different options for different pressure ranges and different amounts of action. Okay, so that's a little bit of, of uh, specification information if we were to go down that street. So now let's head over and have a look at this exact valve. Let's take it apart and let's see what's happening over here. So over here on the bench is that exact pilot controller. It's a two-axis controller because I can move forward for boom lower perhaps, pull back for boom raise. I could go to the left perhaps for swing left. I could move to the right for swing right. And you could see that the wobble plate is pushing on the plungers. I have it badly calibrated and backed off here. There's a lot of empty space before we push the plunger, but that's so I could take it apart in a hurry and make this valve fall apart and show you a little bit of what's inside. Here's the dust boot. We've already got that removed and out of the way. And the pieces are loose because we've been working with this valve quite a bit. So here's one of those plungers that the, the, the wobble plate pushes down on. You can see the plunger is hollow beneath there. And I'm just going to remove the main assembly bolt out of the bottom. And we'll take the whole thing apart, and then we're going to see a lot of Swiss watch parts here all at once. Here we go. So some very important machine surfaces, and the thickness from here down to the T-port, which is just below, is very important. That's the T-port below each of these. There's only a certain thickness of plate there, carefully machined. 
uh, sorry, down into the P port. This is the T port area here, which is drained off through the, the main T port uh, hole. There it is, labeled T. You can see it on the bottom. There it is. There are four signal ports. There is pilot pressure coming in here, four signal ports for our four pressure reducing valves. And T is there. And we know that the T pressure is up in this area here in the aluminum part. Ah, oh yes, 50 bar, right? How much more pressure for this particular model would you want? It's aluminum. And there's our return out the T port there. And here is, here is one of our control spool assemblies. Okay, let's just have a look here at the top and notice that when I push down on this piece here, all I'm doing is compressing springs and it's a floating, it's a floating piece and that the top of the control spool fits into the hollowed section of the plunger. So the plunger is literally pushing down and compressing springs, not directly activating the spool. And then if we look carefully at the control spool, there we see that drilling, that critical orifice that is drilled into the spool and connected to an internal board coming up from the bottom, the signal port end of each of these spools. So your controlled pressure as it goes out of the joystick is actually leaving out through the center bore of the spool, not from some other port. It's through that drilling and out. And if we want to picture the action of balance for a moment, well, balance happens when when the lever stops being actuated, when the directional valve is in the right position, and we've dipped down to get some of that P pressure and tensioned up that directional valve spool to move it to where it needed to be, balance would happen when this orifice would just be sitting in the middle here, and then as the operator lets go of the lever and the springs relax, up would come that drilling into the T area to vent off a little bit and down again from spring pressure against relaxed signal port pressure on the outlet. It's really not too more complicated than that, although I'm sure getting the engineering and surface areas and diameters and everything correct to make all that action happen right is indeed an art. Look at how small the pieces are. So, you know, it's, it's important that that servo or pilot pressure supply be kept very clean. 18, 16, 13, if you know your ISO 4406 cleanliness codes, 18, 16, 13 required for this particular valve in order to function reliably and not be uh, malfunctioning due to particle contaminants. And I think you can see why. Some very close tolerances at work there. Okay, so yeah, we're working with, in this case, on the, um, on, on, the, on the training panel here, we're working with a Parker pilot controller and down here a Kawasaki. I'm going to turn the, the pump back on and bring our, our 900 PSI of pressure back in on the P port, the lower of these two hoses on the side. This is the P port. We bring our source of pilot pressure. I think you can sort of understand it nicely now that the tank port is above, return to tank port is above in most cases. And here are two signal ports coming out the bottom. That's a fairly common configuration to find signal ports coming out the bottom, okay? And I think what you're gonna see here, here I'm just gonna remove the dust boot now so we can have a look, is that we've got two of those uh, pressure reducing valve cartridges in this particular valve. Only one is active at a time. Maybe this is for, for lift of the boom. Maybe this one sends out the right pressure to our spring-loaded uh, directional valve spool to give us boom lower function. But what I want you to see when I turn the pump on here in a minute is that as I move the valve over, there'll be a moment when we hit breakaway pressure and you'll actually see that breakaway pressure push back against my hand and now I'll need a slightly different range of physical force from my hand in order to move the valve through its range. So pump supply pressure is on and just watch what happens here with my hand on the lever as I hit the breakaway. There, you see it fighting me. It just pushed back right there. And you can actually see the hydraulic hoses here shake a little bit. Just at the moment when I hit that breakaway pressure, it pushes back on me. There it is, push back, push back. And so from there on, I've got to actually exert a slightly higher level of force with my hand in order to move the valve through, and you know what's happening inside. That plunger at the top is not directly operating the control spool. It's merely tensioning a spring. And here on the outlet, our signal port, simply 
is pressure. And whenever that pressure stops changing, you need to imagine that balanced moment of the drilling of that spool sitting in that in-between place that is cut off between pilot supply pressure and return to tank whenever that needle stops moving. Whenever the needle is moving, you can imagine that that drilling is open either to the P port as I'm increasing or perhaps to the T port as I'm decreasing my lever action. Okay. Down here on the lower part of our panel is really the same thing, except this particular build has been configured to take a, a foot pedal plate. I used a chunk of tubing for leverage. But again, if we lift up on the boot, I think what you'll see, again, is the same thing. It's a very common type of design. And this one, too, on the left-hand side here. We'll play with the left-hand side, and we'll watch our P3 gauge signal port. This one, too, fights me a little bit. Not quite as bad, because I've got a long lever here in this tube. But just when I hit the breakaway, I can tell that I need to now use more force to keep tensioning the springs, because I'm finally fighting with signal pressure pushing back on the underside of that control spool, working for that balance moment. OK, let's just go have a look at the, the PDF files briefly for these two pilot controllers. And then I'm going to stop and answer your questions. OK, so let's have a look at that Parker model that I had at the top of the learning panel and just see, in general, some of the typical things that are there. Description of what it does. It basically says in this description that you're buying a set of pressure reducing valves packaged in a way that makes it easier for an operator to work with. You see that it's a PCL4 series, and then from there, you make a lot of options and choices. How many control ports? How many of these devices do you want ganged together to make up, say, a bank of valve levers for maybe a truck mounted crane? Very typical application. And then very important part of the code is to choose what your pressure range is going to be. And a code will choose how that spool is set up, where that drilling is positioned on the spool, how large that drilling is, your breakaway pressure versus your final pressure. And if you are specifying, there'd be some graphs further down. Here's a cutaway view from this manufacturer. And I think you can see a similar uh, type of concept is at work. There's our, our control spool. They call it a regulator spool. There's that critical orifice or drilling into the hollowed out valve spool. And there we have it, our, our very important springs as well. An extra centering spring um, out, outside the valve at the top. That can be typical as well. Yeah, there should be some control curves further down. We won't spend any time looking at them, but there they are. Some of these control curves are very linear. You break open a, a slight change in, in the linear path, and then the main linear run of pressure increases on the left-hand side, specified in bar, versus uh, the percentage of lever stroke. And in some cases, the the linearity changes along the way. Then the manufacturer refers to a particular break point where at a certain pressure, the linearity of, of lever stroke uh, percentage of movement to change in pressure changes a little bit. So there's some lingo involved with that, and those are decisions made along the way. The lower one on the learning panel is a Kawasaki foot pedal from the RCV8 C1 series. And here you see they're specifying a maximum pressure of 1400 PSI. That's all that should come in at the very most. And then there's your outlet range, 0 to 640 PSI. Yeah, the large majority of, of piloting systems operate topped out somewhere in that 350 PSI to 700 PSI range, that, that uh, 25 to uh, 50 bar range. This is not untypical for a range of, of pilot pressures. It's usually not much higher than that. Some warnings about the minimum, the maximum amount of back pressure allowed on that T-line shouldn't be higher than 40. Things for the designer to keep track of. And letting us know also on that foot pedal uh, pilot controller that we were into that you'll have a plus and minus 12 degree tilt to that pedal. 
some very interesting things and some more information about the build of this series of valves if you care to, to read about it, including something called a damper, which might be interesting to you somewhere along the way. So let's stop now and take, uh, take some questions. I'm sure there's a few that have come in there. So let's have a look and see what's being asked. Perhaps just input at this point. Just going to scroll through my list of questions there. I was looking forward to hearing about the differences between proportional control that my, fr oh, our, our last week, and servo control and how to choose applications. Yes, so that's a topic that, um, that we'll get to, you bet. We are going to do servo valves uh, further on as spring and summer progresses in, and I can't say exactly just yet what that date is. I, we do have a schedule made up, so I think we'll have it published shortly in a few different places. Have a look at um, have a look at lunchboxsessions.com slash live and we will do our best to, uh, to try and answer that question for you on our schedule as quickly as we can. Let's see if I can find some other questions here in the group. Did I say that last time? Okay, so I guess we're just getting, you know, we're still getting set up a little bit. So I'm just going to look through the list of questions here and see... We've got lots of nice check-ins from around the world, so that's fantastic. Let's see some of the names I might recognize. Tool Time Chris is back from last week. Shrikant Campbell, th great to see you. We've been chatting with each other for a long time. We've got folks here participating from India, from Paris, France, and so wonderful to have you with us for our time today. Thanks for giving us your time. Very much appreciated. I think I saw Dave, my good friend from solarbotics.com in Calgary for so many years. We've traveled to India together. So great to see so many of you. I recognize a good number of the names that are there. We've got folks participating from the Technical College, the Polytechnical Institute over in Saskatchewan. Thanks for joining us. Lots of different folks, so thanks for being here today. We sure appreciate it. And so from here on in now, we're going to move over to electrohydraulics. Hello to CFI there in Oklahoma. Great to have you with us as well. Folks, oh, Charles, Charles Childers from, uh, from Kilgore College in Texas. Great to see you online there as well. Apparently, Romania is watching. So hello, folks. I hope it's going well. I hope you're, this is useful information for you today. Uh, again, chime in with us and ask questions if you've got them. Yes, hello from Turkey as well. Hey, there's Brent from Toronto and Yarno from Finland. Great. Okay, so let's move on to the next chunk of our, of our uh, live broadcast today, which is to have a look at uh, electrohydraulic applications. So I'm just going to switch back over to one of our simulations. Give me just a moment to find it. What you're looking at now, if you see a giant schematic with many complicated looking symbols on screen, is a chunk of a very large mining shovel. This is actually a chunk of a Hitachi mining shovel. And what's happening on the left hand side of the screen, a group of eight uh, valves. These again are pilot valves, but the symbol is drawn a little differently and a lot of large machinery manufacturers use this valve that looks very much like a directional valve when you see the symbol. You think, what am I looking at? A directional valve? Um, Caterpillar also uses a symbol that's very similar to this one. And it, they often leave out the, the infinite uh, variability proportioning bars on the sides of the valve. But at least you know that with the diagonal arrow through the solenoid, at least you know by that means that it is a proportional device in that there's variable amount of signal coming to that solenoid. It's current control that gets it done. We're going to clarify that in a moment. And so I'm just going to work with, with bucket curl here for a minute. I'm going to do some bucket roll in. And so if you're watching that that pilot controller, that electrohydraulic pilot pressure controller that's in the top row there and flashing red, you'll see that pop down and pop back to blocked condition happening that you've got to be able to animate with your mind's eye when you're working with the black and white paper copy. You don't really have a choice. And so you have to sort of 
animate and picture what I'm doing here. I'm increasing outlet pressure from the port that is labeled SE. It's turning progressively more orange and red as I increase the amount of current. We're showing current as a depiction of pulse width modulation by virtue of the, uh, the red and white flashing that you see there, which is how it is handled in the vast majority of cases. It's pulse width modulation that sets us up with our variable current in those solenoids. And what's happening on that SE signal point is that is that yellow line, I have yellow pressure, is that going directly to a large valve spool that lifts or that crowds and dumps our, um, our shovel bucket? Roll in, roll out? No. This is such a large shovel that the first pilot controller, a pressure reducing valve, basically has to pilot another larger pressure reducing valve or pilot controller. They call it a DQR on a Hitachi shovel, a dual quick response valve. It basically amounts to a much larger pressure reducing valve that can handle what does turn out to be a little bit of a volume to move such a very large valve spool back and forth for the sake of rolling that bucket back and forth, which is what is happening by virtue of that very large valve spool that we're moving way over on the right. So this is actually three layers of hydraulic control and there's two layers of electronic control above that. What operates our, our boom or our bucket solenoid is a um, is a electronic control module and before that an electronic lever. So two more layers of, of control that are electronic before we even get to the pilot controller. Okay, so let's move over now and have a look at the physical setup on the learning panel. I'm going to turn my multimeter back on. I'm going to make sure that we are in DC current mode, We're ready to go. So what you just saw in schematic mode a moment ago, a bank of eight electrohydraulic pilot controllers. Here they are mounted in an aluminum casting, um, the, sort of an automotive, lightweight, uh, minimalist uh, casting to, to mount all of these valves in. Sometimes in other shovel models what you will see is the exact same types of hydraulic parts you might select out of a catalog in very squared up uh, valve manifolds. This manufacturer, John Deere and Hitachi, like to build them up this way. They come in eight banks. Some smaller excavators um, will have a two bank or a four bank of those same types of pilot controllers in a few different places. Now, this is the largest one or the largest grouping, eight in a row. And there is one common pilot pressure feed line coming in and one common return to tank for all eight. Um, I don't know what I would do with eight pilot ports here on the learning panel, so we've got six of them blocked. We have two of them active. We have the one that is stamped SC available, and we simply have a pressure testing hose going to the digital pressure gauge that's on the left over here. We have another one a little bit further down on the bank that's stamped SB, and again, another pressure test hose going to the digital pressure gauge on the right. Our multimeter measuring current in series with one of our two solenoids. So when I lift up on the lever and you see current taking place, that will just be our, our upper of two different solenoids for pilot controllers. And we'll have a look at the internal parts here in a minute and see just what's inside there. Because again, it's about parts that are very tiny and hardly move. Okay, DC amperage. So here I am operating a solenoid. I haven't turned on the hydraulic pump yet, so you don't see any pressure building on our left pressure gauge. But you can see that as I deflect a joystick, in this case the joystick, the lever, is sending in a variable voltage into an amplifier or an electronic controller of some sort. We don't have a John Deere or Hitachi style of, of uh, electronic controller here. We just have a generic one we put together for our own internal usage. But as I deflect the lever towards maximum, we eventually end up at about 400 milliamps, which is pretty typical for the John Deere and Hitachi um, electrohydraulic piloting valves. That's typically their maximum current that they send to those types of valves. And so this variability of current that I'm moving through is going to turn into 
variability of pressure as well. When I activate the pump here in a moment and we watch the left hand pressure gauge, which is monitoring the pilot valve that I'm, that I'm hooked up to with the ammeter. So just let me start the hydraulic pump. So we have some pilot pressure coming in. We've got 800, we've got 800 PSI of source pressure on our pilot line coming into this bank of pilot controller valves. And again, as I deflect the lever in one direction for now and start to move it through uh, variable current, you can see that the pressure available on the outlet of that port is being increased to give us more and more of what is available at the moment from our pilot supply pressure coming in. So only 200 PSI outlet of 900 possible at the moment. And can we get all the way to 900? No. Once we're up at about 400 milliamps on the Hitachi shovels, typically 400 milliamps turns into in and around a 600 PSI signal. That's typically all that happens. So I can't even get to the 900 PSI source pressure. That's it. These valves are set to limit as a pressure reducing function, the maximum amount that would be available. Now in some cases, for fine tuning in the machinery, especially if these pilot controllers are being used to control parts of the pump, the Kawasaki pumps that are used in Hitachi and John Deere excavators and shovels have a lot of control features on them and sometimes several of these valves are being used to control the maximum pressure that the, that the pump will, will work at before it goes into pressure compensate. It might also activate the horsepower limiting function, the torque limiting function of the pump. It might actually even angle the swash plate and decide what the ultimate displacement ought to be. So at 600 PSI, you typically find that the screw is almost flush with the nut and then can adjustments be made in accordance with what the manual might recall uh, what, for, what the manual might call for the technician's manual absolutely but you can't just keep turning it any more than about two turns of the adjustment key can damage the o-ring and so that is the maximum about two millimeters approximately two threads you'll see it up here on an example here on this on this two bank, you'll see one is set flush, that's kind of the maximum pressure, and one has about two threads sticking out. That's a reduced pressure that would be down around 520. So right now we've got about 600 PSI at the gauge on the left, and it's about 10 PSI per quarter turn. Sometimes it takes a while before it'll settle in. So by the time I go one complete revolution, of maximum two, we might be down somewhere around 560, and that might be part of a tuning where 400 milliamps is supposed to top out at 560 as opposed to 600. I noticed in the particular manual for this valve, it said five newton meters of torque to tighten up that jam nut, and then underneath it, it said 45 foot pounds. But I double checked my conversions, it should have been 45 inch pounds. So, in a few places, it got written incorrectly. I think you guys know what 45 foot pounds would be like. That's half the torque of, your, of the lug nuts for the tires on your pickup truck. So, be careful of that. Five newton meters, about 45 inch pounds for, for tightening up that, that jam nut. All right, so that's a brief look at the live functioning of the pilot controller. If I push down on the joystick, we won't see current reading because I was only reading one of two, but we'll see, we'll see pressure build on the gauge on the right. I'm activating a completely separate solenoid this time, the third one down on the right bank here. Okay, so this is pilot pressure control where we're pushing on another object somewhere else to control it. What object is that? Well, in our case, we're just deadheading against digital pressure gauges. If we were pushing against a little control piston inside a Kawasaki pump, which would be popular in this case, is there a tiny bit of flow involved if a spool moves? Yes, but it's only a thimble. It's only a, a fraction of what might be in a... Um, in a cough syrup or medicine dosa dosage cup, uh, very tiny amount. So this is really not a flow control application. This is force controlling done by pressure controlling. 
All right, we'll turn the pump off and let's have a look at some of the tiny pieces inside and see what's going on. So instructor Mark, he's really good at getting our valves cut in half, right Mark? Isn't this a lot of fun? And so he likes to find out exactly what are the pieces inside, what do they look like. Some valves not meant to be disassembled after they've been stamped and what have you. So cutting them in half sometimes yields what we need to find out. This is one of the eight banks here with the valves removed. Each one of these uh, valve spool and sleeve cartridges came up out of one of these holes, quite separate from the, the solenoid top on half that was, uh, the solenoid top half that was bolted down. And so that was the assembly times eight. And in fact, if you look inside there, I'll just try to work it back and forth, that middle hole, you'll see two what they refer to in the manual as flanges in this case. Some of you might call these the lands on a spool, but there's a, they're just flanges and they barely cover up that center port. It's a zero lapped configuration. I'm going to show you that in a, in a digital um, caliper measurement here in a moment. But moving over, so when you saw me adjusting the screw a moment ago, was I physically pushing hard on a major control element inside the valve like the armature? No, I was not. I was merely changing the tension of a pretty soft spring, kind of like from a, from a ballpoint pen. This is often the case that making adjustments Ian was talking about servo valves earlier. Quite often when you make a nulling adjustment on a servo valve, you're doing nothing but either relaxing or tensioning a spring and giving that armature a little bit more bias push from the spring or relaxing that off a little bit. So the, the, the slightly heavier return spring from below returns the armature to the top and when the, when the solenoid coil is energized, the magnetic field pulls that armature down and again, it's still not actively pushing directly on our spool below. It's merely squishing a spring. That's all it's doing. And then pushing this spool downward inside the sleeve and aha, here's a fairly lightweight spring that's going to be responsible for that balance cutoff action that needs to happen because as I said a moment ago, the diameter of the outlet. This is the outlet port going out to signal whatever our piloted device is. This is returned to tank down here. This is our, our pilot supply p-port pressure coming in there and we're very much in a zero lapped condition when you measure these two distances. Oh yes, and we'll see in the video as well. I don't know if we see up the the bottom end of the spool, but there's a small Allen screw down inside with a small orifice drilled in there. It's 0.4 millimeters or 0 0.016 of an inch, 16 thou. That little orifice is a damping orifice and that could get jammed up with contaminants so easily, bad things would happen. Critical tolerances. Each one of the outlet ports has a large screen contamination filter just designed to catch major parts, major chunks of solid contamination and trap them, probably coming back from downstream when you back the pressure off in hopes that we won't jam up our very fine critical little valves. All right, we're going to switch to a little bit of a 3D movie here. And this is also on lunchbox sessions where you can sort of tour through this valve. And we're going to start off in neutral state. And let's see what happens on the inside just to appreciate the tiny motions taking place. Okay, so there's that, that spring we just highlighted. If it's at rest, that spring has the valve at the top. And so we're bleeding out our signal port pressure to tank there at the bottom because of that clearance. And then as we deflect the joystick and go for an increased amount of current, there you see a buildup of current above, that current in the solenoid is going to pull that slug of steel called the armature, it's pull it down. And it's going to squish that, that, that middle spring, if you will. And that middle spring, as it gets squished, is just going to make our, our valve spool deflect downward and connect our P-port pressure, our supply of pilot pressure, and allow us to increase outlet signal port pressure.
And of course, we've left our valve open for a long period of time there so that we can talk about it and teach. You know these are short moments of change, short duration. So here we are piloting another spool further downstream that needs a, a shoving force. And as we push down on that spool, its spring there at the bottom that you see highlighted is pushing back. And that's the correct setup pressure that is back pressured back to our pilot controller. And then as we go back to the pilot controller here in a moment, what we're gonna see is that back pressure. Again, these are prolonged uh, short duration times for us to be able to talk. That surface area pushed upward on the larger of two flanges. They're different diameters. This one has larger surface area and pushes the valve shut. And we're in that balanced cutoff condition there for a moment, holding a pressure because the next spool on the chain, we want it held in a particular position, a particular valve spool. What happens when we go to decreased pressure and the, the operator lets off on the joystick a little bit, lets the lever deflect back towards neutral? That's a decrease in current in our solenoid. So now our spring is going to want to do what it does and it's going to move that spool upward by pushing on that surface area there where you see the yellow arrows pushing on the larger flange surface area, driving that valve spool up out of a balanced condition and letting us bleed off our outlet pressure and bleed it back to tank to reduce the pressure that we had on our outlet. And now that downstream spool itself is going back to whatever its neutral state is. We don't see that downstream pressure, but it's happening there somewhere. Just a little break in bandwidth for our 3D movie for a moment. It'll probably come back if we just give it a second or two. Sometimes a little trouble with bandwidth as we're being, as we're broadcasting from several different sources at once here. And I think you got the idea. Okay, so that's the action of that valve. In fact, I'll just switch over and, and have a look at that zero lapped condition. I told you that that valve was zero lapped. If we measure from one surface of the flange, the larger of two flanges on the left, larger on the right would cover up that port. Point one nine, I was measuring in inches with my, uh, with my digital calipers, 0.1965, and then if we measure the internal diameter of that control port in the middle, look at that. It's the exact same. So that's a zero lap or a critical valve spool. And yeah, we've had a good look at that. All right, so let's, um, let's go and yeah, just before we, we answer questions, I'll just go back to the beginning here. Let's just see, was there anything else we wanted to play now that bandwidth caught up? Ah, uh, yes, we wanted to have a look at that damping orifice at the bottom, and unfortunately just having a little bit of trouble playing the 3D movie now for whatever reason, due to probably our internet here in the building today. But that damping orifice there at the bottom, a very important piece that l forces oil to exchange from below the spool to above every single time it moves. And that keeps the spool from being too responsive and overshooting and undershooting, which would be a unfortunate thing that might make for jittery, unstable pressures on the outlet. So by having that orifice there, 0 0.4 millimeters or 0 0.016 of an inch, very small, very important in slowing down the action of the overall valve spool so that it doesn't overshoot, undershoot, and create um, unstable pressure fluctuations that you don't want. But you can imagine how much dirt it would not take to plug that up and then the valve will be stuck. What do you think will happen if that plugs up? What's going to happen? If you increase solenoid signal, the valve may not move. If it's hydraulically locked, the spool may not move. And so you might go into all kinds of diagnostic routines and measuring currents and pressures and you might just plain be hydraulically locked and stuck. An unfortunate scenario. All right, so to learn more about that, we have a complete lesson in lunchbox sessions that takes you through all the functioning. And even though we're showing off an application that is perhaps Hitachi and John Deere in origin, the general principles of what's happening for this type of piloting, especially on a large excavator or a large shovel, are very much the same from machine to machine. And so many things there are similar. Let's take a moment now to answer questions and uh, 
want to change away from that. Yeah, so let's answer your questions and see what's there. Okay, I'll just scroll down my list and see. What type of solenoid... What is the type of solenoid used? Well, copper wires uh, winding to, uh, I think, approximately um, 20 ohms, if I remember correctly, Lingesh. Um, very basic type of solenoid. No permanent magnets in the ones that I was just showing you. Uh, fairly basic solenoid copper winding. Um, Vishnu asks, can we adjust pressure and flow during operation? Well, again, as you know, the, the pilot circuitry itself is generally not about flow. But it is most certainly about pressure. And so, yes, Vishnu, adjusting pressure is something we can do during operation, and quite often you need to exactly do that. I think you saw that when I was, um, when I was changing the, uh, the, the, the set screw that squished that little spring, we were getting a slightly different top end pressure. Yeah, and so, yeah, that's a little bit of a, a calibration there. Somebody asked, 0.4 millimeter of diameter, DJ asked, DJ88, you asked 0.4 millimeter of diameter of the cross section? No, it's actually 0.4 millimeter diameter was the tiny little drilling right through the center of that orifice here. Maybe we'll just see if we can bring that back up on screen here for a second. I'll find that little orifice piece in the session. I know it's here somewhere. And then Owen on camera can bring that back up here, perhaps. Sorry for the fun. I'm just going to see if I can find it. I don't, s I'm not sure at the m exact moment where to go, but there it is at the bottom. And that 0.4 millimeter is just the drilling right in the middle of a little set screw. That's it. It's a very tiny little hole. And I think you'll see the piece again here. There it is, orifice, and just drilled through such a tiny little amount there. Yeah, so that's it, the drilling. Um, Samer asked, is it a 115 joystick? Yeah, I'm using PQ Control's joystick. It is a 115 series, and I could send you more information later on exactly what amplifier board we're using there if you want to try and build something similar. So make sure you send us your email address, Samer, and we'll try to get back to you as, as to what we're using there, if that's something you want to use. Yes, you can attach that PQ joystick and amplifier to a lot of different proportional valves, but typically you have to do some programming to look after what your maximum uh, current might be and what have you and, and what your <coughs> pulse width modulation frequency might be and some settings like that that are programmable, Samer. Thanks for that. Good question. Um, Jarno from Finland, he asked, do you have Rexroth 40H7 remote valves? No, we only have a certain amount of, man, we've got racks in here of shelves of all kinds of valves and boxes and it's hard to keep track of them all, but no, we've only got one or two of the Rexroth uh, pilot controller joysticks and they're both 40H6 series. Um, don't know what all the different models are. There's so many out there. We just can't get to know them all. But always interested in learning more. So, um, Yarno, if you want to uh, email with me, we could dig up a data sheet and go back and forth if there's interest there. Subhash asked, what will happen maybe if one side, let me see here. What will happen if one side of pressure reducing valve is wrongly set? Yeah, well, I mean, if a pressure reducing valve is wrongly set, you may get um, a different type of action than is desired. Your, your pump, if it's a pump controller, you may get more maximum flow than you're supposed to get, or you may get less than the maximum flow that you're supposed to get when you have the stick fully deflected. So yeah, having pilot circuitry correctly calibrated and, and having pressure reducing valves, even if they're manual, correctly set, is very important, okay? So um, I understand we might be having a little bit of bandwidth interfering with smooth streaming. Hopefully, hopefully the buffering will work out okay for you. Sometimes we have a little bit of trouble with bandwidth from our side, so I hope it's still okay on your end. I'll speak slowly for a bit. How do you adjust pressure? How do you adjust... How do you adjust shock? Well, I guess I'm not sure exactly, Piriano, what you're asking with that one, but um, 
Typically, if you have a lot of shock in a system, perhaps an accumulator is needed, perhaps a port relief valve, uh, feel free to email me some more if you have more detailed questions about that. Our email address, info at lunchboxsessions.com. Somebody asked from earlier on in the presentation, uh, yeah, Gaurav Pawar asked, could you please explain breakaway pressure? Breakaway pressure with a joystick or a pilot pedal is that first pressure that shows up as you start to deflect the handle, as you start to deflect the lever, you get to a place where all of a sudden you get your first amount of outlet pressure on the signal port and whatever that first pressure is that's your breakaway pressure thanks great question Lingesh asked how back pressure affects the working of the valve yeah okay so you saw a in our in our data sheets there was a, a spot one of the data sheets says that the return to tank pressure should never be higher than 40 psi yes higher and higher back pressure typically will reduce the amount of, of pressure reducing function that you get and so it can change the responsiveness of the valve and it could also change the range of outlet pressures available so very important to keep the tank pressures um, at the at the maximum of what the of what the pilot controller manufacturer allows. How overlap makes a difference in operation? Yes, also a good question, uh, Gaurav. Um, an overlapping spool basically means that um, you know the, the valve will be a little less responsive. Perhaps the operator may move the, the stick a little farther, even though he may already be in mid-position. He may have to move the stick a little farther before the valve may change its signal port outlet. So for a very touchy valve where the slightest change in the angle of that lever produces a signal port outlet that's what's going to happen with your zero lap valve or your critical lap valve it'll be very responsive and changes happen right away as you shift that lever Lingesh also asked is it a normal or proportional solenoid in the electrohydraulic valves we were looking at I'm sure that the manufacturer would say it's a very special it is most certainly a proportional solenoid um, I don't believe the ones that we're working with there have permanent magnets in but sometimes proportional solenoids do but yes it is indeed a proportional solenoid all right so that's probably all we'll have time for on that particular set of questions today if we missed your questions then again feel free to email them to us I'll try to catch up with you as we go uh, thanks yeah so CDIG and the services of lunchbox sessions are brought to you I'm Carl Owens on the camera instructor Mark you saw him interacting as well also we have Nathan Crystal Robin Chris Ivan Alex and Lenore special mention also to Ted Keel and Emily and Grant for their contributions throughout the year thanks also to fluidpowerworld.com and thanks once again to our main sponsor today HBC Radiomatic with industrial wireless remote controls our next YouTube live will be May 12th and at that time we'll be working with pressure relief valves of all kinds very simple and basic ones to very fancy ones with four ports uh, and again some electro hydraulics because I love getting electro hydraulics involved in there thank you everyone for participating today we sure appreciate you joining us hopefully that was helpful information for whatever types of of applications you have in your line of work stay safe I hope you're you're busy with enough work to keep it engaging during this time and we look forward to seeing you again on May 12 this is Carl from lunchboxsessions.com thanks for watching <laughs>